Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so basically today I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview of what the IWEA Dispatch Down Working Group is doing, uh, looking at the whole area of, of, of constraint and curtailment and uh, in the short to medium term looking at ways how to minimise it. And then considering the theme of today, talking about 2030, I'm also going to maybe do a bit more about the challenges of addressing curtailment in the context of 2030. Okay, so in terms of uh, dispatch down, so it's basically it's constraint and curtailment. So we've basically done a, a, like a, a bottom-up analysis uh, looking at how much all the individual wind farms have been constrained or curtailed. Uh, and when you start putting this into numbers, it sort of puts the, I suppose, the, 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 the issue in some sort of context. So looking at 2018, uh, the total dispatch down was 700 gigawatt hours. Uh, 700 gigawatt hours is equivalent to 250 megawatts of output from a wind farm for a year. So it's basically the equivalent of all the wind farms in West Galway's output, and that's how much energy we're actually constraining and curtailing uh, well, in 2018. Uh, it's also about 350,000 tonnes of CO2, and when we actually were looking at the actual total revenue, it was about 50 million. When you then split it into constraint and curtailment, a curtailment in 2018 was around 4.2%, and then the actual constraint, which is more local and can differ from wind farm to wind farm, was about 2.5%. The main areas that we're seeing constraints were the west of, uh, or sorry, Northern Ireland and the northwest of Ireland. Uh, they were seeing constraints maybe of 4 or 5%. Moving on to 2019, and at this stage with data for the first half of the year, and we've actually seen an increase in the overall amount of dispatch down, partly due to there being more wind on the system, but also due to some new sort of uh, issues. Uh, in this case, so far, the revenue was about 37 million, so over the year, it's probably going to look like more like 70 million. So that's quite a step up from 2018. Uh, and when you split it down, we are seeing increased curtailment, partly due to there being more wind on the system. Uh, but we're also seeing higher constraint levels. Uh, we're, we're seeing, as well as the Northwest and Northern Ireland, we've also had quite a lot of constraints in the Southwest, mainly due to the issues around the loss of a transformer money point. So that's sort of put me into a bit of context, and sort of because of this now being a, a very big issue uh, for the industry, uh, I we have set up a, it's a dedicated working group. Uh, where we brought together uh, the main asset owners of these wind farms and, uh, and operators, and you can see a list of the companies who are members of the Dispatch Down Working Group. Uh, they represent about 80% of the uh, operational wind farms. Uh, and as a working group, we basically uh, are, are under the Asset Management Committee, but we're very much working across the whole of IWEA uh, through the Grid Committee, the Markets Committee, uh, and uh, as well as have, being involved in our own working group, some of the issues overlap into things like PR5, which I'll come on to later on. Uh, there's a new grid development working group, which is hugely important in terms of reducing constraints. And we're working with the markets committee on issues like uh, you know, effective operation of interconnectors. Uh, so we basically had the group up and running since about March. And over that period, our plan was to, you know, in that six months, to, to sort of uh, get into the issue and really understand what was really the drivers and come up with a work plan uh, to implement over the next 12, 18 months uh, to see, to understand it better, but also to see how we can maybe minimize it. So the, basically the goals of the group, uh, we obviously want to minimize curtailment, minimize constraints. Uh, linked to constraints is very much the issue of outages on the transmission system and the distribution system. So again, if we can minimize them, we'll be able to minimize constraints. And to basically, to do that, well, the first thing, you know, uh, what we maybe weren't doing, and we don't think the wider industry is doing, is if you can't, you know, you can't really manage something that you're not measuring, so we're doing a lot more monitoring analysis. And then, in terms of lobbying, well, most of the engagement is directly with AirGrid. I suppose you can sort of say our job is to, you know, keep AirGrid's feet to the fire, but in reality, it really is having a good working relationship with AirGrid, which I have to say, since we've set up, uh, I think we, we have developed a good working relationship on specific issues like the money point transformers and on the general issues. We've had workshops and meetings, and uh, hopefully, you know, and in line with AirGrid's new strategy, it is about working in, in partnerships, and, and that's how we see the group uh, working with AirGrid. Uh, but at the same time, 
Zergrid is Sony, but in behind that as well, it needs to be NIE and network, it used to be networks as well. Uh, other areas that the working group is interested in is the whole area of compensation for dispatch down, and that's how we actually overlap into uh, the, the whole new clean energy package where there's talk about compensation and, and even the changes in maybe priority dispatch. So again, it's another huge area, and uh, we have a dedicated working group on the clean energy package because of the issues of priority dispatch, but also because of the, the, the opportunities around compensation as well. Uh, the last area is probably in the whole area of provision of, of new services. Uh, you know, so there are other opportunities, uh, maybe for wind farms to provide services, and other and and for IWEA members who are involved in areas like uh, battery storage to, to provide services, and we're trying to see how this all ties together. So in terms of our actual action plan, you know, it can sort of be broken down. There's the ongoing tasks. There's then the supporting work we're doing with it, with the other working groups within IWEA, and then we have our own sort of t uh, top objectives, and I'll go through a couple of those. So the sort of ongoing tasks, not going to go through all this in detail, but it's very much, you know, well, first of all, there's the AirGrid's DS3 program, and for a good number of years, we've been supporting that as much as we can along the way. I've already mentioned we need to be doing a lot more analysis uh, to understand the amount of dispatch down and what's causing it. Uh, and give a couple of examples of that in a minute. Uh, and then the whole communication and, and working with the likes of Airgood and Sony to, to, to see how we bring forward you know, uh, some solutions. Uh, in terms of this, as I mentioned, the supporting working groups, there's Airgood's Good Development Working Group. So as already highlighted earlier by Paul Blunt, like one of the big challenges for 2030 is building grid and very much acknowledged in, in Michael's presentation as well. So IWEA has a new group where we're, we're trying to see how, do we, how, does, how does the wind industry uh, you know, be involved and support ESB Networks, AirGrid, Sony and NIE in, in delivering this grid we need. Uh, there's the PR5 working group, I think Peter O'Shea mentioned that earlier, it's the price review that ESB and AirGrid will be going through over the next six months, very much setting the funding for the first half of the, of the next decade, which will probably be critical in setting the path for 2030. And I mentioned, already mentioned the whole clean energy package, compensation, and priority dispatch. So in terms of our top objectives, say I'm not going to go through these ones in detail, but two examples. So one is interconnection. So if we actually look at interconnectors at the moment, uh, the analysis we've done shown, shows that during curtailment events, this isn't looking you know, at a continuous operation, but during curtailment events, the likes of EWIC is only really operating at 50% of its capacity. Uh, and like we, we're sort of trying to delve into why is that. Uh, you may see this slide before, which is looking at the general uh, operation of the interconnectors, which in the new ISEM seem to be quite effective in the day ahead market, that basically the flow of the interconnectors are following the prices in the different markets. But when we actually go and look at it in the balancing market during curtailment events, it's, a, it's sort of a different story. We're actually seeing that 45% of the time the prices uh, aren't basically following the flows in the, uh, of the actual interconnectors. So at the moment, we're currently developing a paper that we want to go back and present to, uh, to Airgrid and to the regulators around things like maybe more counter trading and maybe changes to the market to make the interconnectors more effective. Uh, the other example would be just how curtailment gets allocated. So uh, the analysis we've done on this is basically showing that you know, we sort of understood that all wind farms should be curtailed around the same time, but we're seeing is that would be pretty much the case in the Republic, a bit less so in Northern Ireland, but between North and South, there's a big differential, and in sort of in starting to engage with AirGrid, there probably is some issues about wind farms being, you know, uh, being put down as curtailing when they're actually uh, being constrained, and considering you get compensation for constraint in Northern Ireland, you know, there's a commercial implication and benefit from sorting this out. So these are the sort of things we're trying to do by doing analysis and trying to work with AirGrid then to, to see is there any ways to minimize and curtail curtailment constraints. Uh, so sort of moving on to uh, just a, a quick sort of uh, glimpse looking forward to 2030. Uh, There's a couple more of the slides from work myself and uh, Paul Blunt have been doing along with DCU, something that's basically a piece of work funded by SAI. Uh, the whole presentation takes a bit longer. I think in, in Paul's presentation earlier, there was a link to the presentation he did for Engineers Ireland. And I think at the next IWEA, uh, policy workshop, we'll, we'll do the full presentation. But just sort of jumping into the results, uh, looking at, you know, well, what, cur what could curtailment be in 2030? You know, and I suppose 
uh, thinking to Simon's presentation, this is probably the upside view on curtailment if we do a lot of the things we need to do and do them well. Uh, so if we do get SNSP up, if we get NinGen down, if we build interconnectors, you know, the benefit of increased capacity factors and wind farms, you know, the fact if we had solar mix, would that help reduce curtailment? Uh, and then benefits from flexibility and demand side management, uh, electric vehicles, electric heating. So when we sort of did the analysis in this and look at the results, what we're basically seeing, uh, so basically the dial is saying, well, what is the curtailment level? Or sorry, what's the percentage resi on the system? And obviously we're aiming to get up to at least 70%. Uh, and what, I, what we basically did was we tried to keep curtailment at 5% and brought in more wind, but brought in the mitigation measures to see you know, can we keep curtailment at 5% and get up to 70% and maybe beyond? Uh, the first interesting thing that you see is in 2030, uh, you know, at the moment curtailment level is 5%, but we're only at 35% renewables, whereas this is showing by 2030, because of actual demand growth, we could actually get to 48% and still a 5%. And that's basically because of all the demand growth around uh, data centers and hopefully EVs and heat pumps. So that increased demand in itself will, will help to uh, reduce curtailment. But at the same time, that doesn't you know, necessarily get us towards, uh, fully towards the 70% target. So we need uh, other measures similar to what we've done for 2020 with DS3 and interconnection. So the first one is, well, what happens if we increased uh, SNSP and brought down MinGen? And I think as Paul was saying earlier, this is you know, one of the big benefits. So you can see here, you know, uh, by SNSP at 90%, MinGen down to 700, we're seeing quite an uplift. Now, I think it's good to see Ergoder even thinking of more ambitious uh, targets for SNSP and MinGen. But again, this was based on the analysis we did uh, earlier this year. More interconnection capacity, again, has a big impact. So we've seen the two new interconnectors coming in. But as we've really sort of discussed, it's how effective those interconnectors are is really critical. Here, we're assuming we're exporting 90% of the time, and we get a huge benefit. If we don't have that export, we're not going to see that benefit. Uh, some other uh, factors, well, what about if we had an increased capacity factor of, of wind on the system, uh, which would mean producing a lot more sort of power in the shoulders, for one of word. That in itself, if we had a higher capacity factor, wind on the system would allow us to put more on the system and keep curtailment at 5%. Similarly, you know, uh, because the inverse correlation between wind and solar generation, uh, by putting some solar generation onto the system, we would, act, we would, uh, would actually see the ability to, to keep curtailment at 5% and, and again increase the target. Uh, now this is not sort of saying what the optimum amount of solar on our system is economically, it's just saying from a curtailment sort of a sweet spot, you know, uh, a good capacity of solar in the system uh, is certainly part of the mix we see in meeting the 2030 targets. Uh, other benefits could be, you know, if we had flexibility in EV and heat demand, allowing us to move uh, demand maybe from uh, the daytime to the nighttime when there's more curtailment going on. And again, that would allow us to, you can see at this stage, we're actually way up past 80%. Uh, now, again, it's all caveated that this is these measures coming in, you know, being very, very effective. Uh, and, you know, history has shown we haven't been able to, you know, maybe... Uh, always bring them in is effective, but it's something we're always working on. But it's very positive that whenever you look at all the measures, including uh, you know the flexibility of heat uh, uh, EVs and of heat pumps, you're seeing us up at you know uh, we're practically up at 86 uh, percent. Now, I say that's a very upside view of curtailment my perspective, but it does show it can be achieved. Uh, with the types of measures that we are discussing and are in the public domain. Uh, apologies, that was a very quick run through those slides, but I thought considering Paul sort of had already introduced it earlier, it was probably, and we're talking about 2030, it's, it's sort of relevant to today's discussion. Uh, so basically in summary from my presentation, uh, we have our dispatch line working group up and running. Uh, we have a proper work plan in place. Uh, but key to the whole thing will be engagement with uh, AirGrid uh, over, the, over the next period uh, to see how we can make some improvements. Uh, and similarly, for 2030, you know, we can uh, achieve the 70% with you know, moderate levels of curtailment, but there's a good number of mitigations required to achieve that. Uh, thank you very much.